All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Amelia Duval, and I'm one of the organizers of this seminar, this year's quantitative seminar series from the Converse Lab. And I'll begin by acknowledging the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And we also acknowledge that we live and work on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. Um, and as a bird person at SAFS, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anna Tucker, who will be presenting her talk, Extracting Insights from 20 Years of Shorebird Monitoring Data. And Anna Tucker is the Assistant Unit Leader for Wildlife within the US Geological Society, Iowa Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at Iowa State University. Her research combines wildlife population ecology, quantitative methods, and applied science to assist managers with decision-making in the face of uncertainty. She's interested in the development and application of quantitative tools for understanding past and current drivers of wildlife population change and predicting future status, including hierarchical Bayesian models, population viability analysis, and dynamic optimization. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Anna. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Amelia, for that introduction. And thanks to Abby and Brielle as well for the invitation to speak today. Um, I was really excited to get the invitation to speak in this seminar series because of your emphasis on quantitative methods. And I thought this would be a fun opportunity to sort of tell a side of the story that I don't often get to tell, um, a little bit more of like the behind the scenes look at some of my work on migratory shorebirds in Delaware Bay. And I deliberately use the word extracting here in my title because I really want to talk about the process and challenges of analyzing these data. And I'm hoping that you'll all see some parallels to challenges that you face in the systems that you work in. So first, just to tell you a bit about Delaware Bay and migratory shorebirds. So I started to work in this system for my PhD work, and that work has continued um, and is ongoing. Delaware Bay is located on the Atlantic coast of the US in between Delaware and New Jersey. And it's a key shorebird stopover site because of the aggregation of spawning horseshoe crabs that occurs in late May and early June, which coincides with shorebird stopover. So horseshoe crab eggs, as you can see in this picture, so here um, in the top is a female horseshoe crab partially buried in the sand after spawning. And all of these green and yellow and orange and blue dots are horseshoe crab eggs. And these are a really fat, rich, and easily digestible food item for shorebirds. Many migrants use stopover sites during migration. These are sites where many individuals stop to rest and refuel before continuing their journey. And Arctic breeding shorebirds have some of the longest migrations, incredibly long as they move between their Arctic breeding grounds and lower latitude non-breeding sites. As a group, Arctic breeding shorebirds are declining globally and they face many threats from throughout their annual cycle, but stopover sites play an important role in their ecology. And stopover sites are also really important for monitoring shorebirds and other long distance migrants. They're really hard to monitor during the breeding season because they breed in remote areas and are very um, at low densities often. And they're very dispersed during the non-breeding season, covering a wide area. But during, my, uh, during stopover, we get a large proportion of the population congregated in one place on a predictable annual schedule. Delaware Bay has received a lot of conservation attention because of unregulated harvest of horseshoe crabs in the late 90s that was linked to a decline in shorebirds seen in the bay, particularly one species, the red knot. And horseshoe crab harvest is currently managed under an adaptive harvest management plan that includes as part of its objective um, to ensure an objective to ensure the population stability of red knot, which is really, I think, pretty um, interesting and unique. It's one of the only, if not the only, fisheries management plans in the US that has as part of its objective the conservation of another non-fish species. And so to improve conservation of shorebirds as well as management of horseshoe crabs in this region, managers need a good understanding of the links between what happens at stopover and population demographics for red knot. 
So I'm going to talk a bit about two species today, actually, the red knot and the ruddy turnstone. So these are both medium-sized sandpipers. They breed in the Arctic and overwinter in the southeast U.S., uh, as well as Central and South America. One key difference, however, is that red knot are threatened, they're federally listed as threatened, while ruddy turnstone populations seem to be stable. And one potential explanation for this is that red knot seem to be especially reliant on horseshoe crab eggs, while ruddy turnstone forage more generally. All of the data that I'll talk about today come from the Delaware Shorebird Project. So this is an interagency collaboration to monitor shorebirds during spring stopover in Delaware. And this project was started in the late 90s in response to that horseshoe crab and shorebird population crash. So data collection includes counts, both from the ground and from fixed wing aircraft, trapping birds with cannon nets to collect measurements and weights and to mark them with these field readable leg flags. So these are plastic leg flags that are inscribed with unique alphanumeric codes. And a lot of time is spent during the season by observers sitting on a beach with spotting scopes, scanning flocks, looking for these marked individuals. So for a little bit more information about the data set, so birds are captured in mixed foraging flocks using cannon nets. Here are some of the team extracting some birds from a cannon net after it's been deployed. And uh, this trapping effort began in 1997. And there have been between six to 16 catches per year. It can vary quite a bit, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and has resulted in nearly 30,000 birds processed, about 150 birds per catch. The superstar data set is the Mark Resite data. So those plastic leg flags were first deployed in 2005. And over the past 14 years, um, volunteers have recorded nearly 130,000 resightings. And this is just in a three week period of May each year. So that's about 9,600 unique individuals from three different species. And then finally, the aerial counts. So these counts began in the late 80s um, and ended in 2014. And for these counts, a fixed wing air, uh, airplane is flown low over the entire bay shore. And as the plane approaches, the birds flush up into these large flocks and observers in the plane attempt to count the number of each species present. And all of this data collection is largely a volunteer based effort. So this is a really small portion of the 2018 field crew. In any given year, there's between 40 and 63 different people that have come to help collect data, working with the team either for just a few days or staying for the whole season. And there are a number of long-term volunteers who stay for the whole season and have been doing that for the past 10 or 15 years that are absolutely vital to this monitoring effort. So usually when I talk about Delaware Bay shorebirds, um, these are the types of to topics that I talk about. Ecological questions like how variable is the timing and rate of mass gain among years? How do species differ in their response to stopover conditions? What are the direct and indirect effects of stopover on population dynamics? Or management questions like what is the effect of horseshoe crab abundance on red knot demographic? Uh, are shorebird populations stable, declining, increasing, and what drives those dynamics? And those are all interesting questions. Um, I'll touch on some of them throughout my talk today, but I thought that this would be a good opportunity to focus more on the process of answering those questions and some of the challenges that have come up in analyzing these data. Now, challenges may be a bit negative, so um, Let's reframe the narrative here and call these opportunities for creative problem solving. Um, being a little bit tongue in cheek, but in all seriousness, I think that quantitative ecology is a really creative field. And the problem solving aspects are a part of the job that I really find rewarding. So the opportunities that I'll talk about today are data collection by volunteers, variable sampling effort among years, and flow through dynamics. So the solutions to these problems maybe aren't necessarily new, um, but I think it'd be fun to talk about the tools that I use to address them in this system. All right, so starting off with this issue of data collection by volunteers. Well, what does that mean for the data? 
So when you have volunteer observers, or this also applies to you know, community science efforts, you often have observers with a large variation in their background, experience, and skill level. So for example, with the Delaware Shorebird Project, we get undergraduate interns who are maybe having their first fieldwork experience. We get birders of all types, uh, curious locals who like wildlife and think it might be interesting to help with the project for a weekend, research scientists who come down to relive their field tech days, as well as internationally recognized leaders in shorebird research um, that dedicate weeks of their time every year to this project. Uh, you also might see uneven spatial distribution of sampling effort. So uh, in our case, observers are often sent to where the birds are to do reciting, and you don't necessarily have random spatial coverage of all the beaches in the bay, as well as uneven temporal distribution of effort. In our case, everyone wants to volunteer on Memorial Day weekend, and the field crew uh, during the week is usually much sparser. And these latter two issues have come up in some cases, um, but for the most part, we can deal with them without too much trouble. What I want to focus on here is this first issue of variation in background and skill level, because reading shorebird leg flags is really hard. Uh, why is it hard? Hopefully this video works. Um, so birds are usually densely packed in these mixed species flocks and they're moving around constantly. As you can see from this poor attempt at a <laughs> digiscoped uh, video, flags can get dirty or stained or the ink can fade over time, making them harder to read. Um, some color, some flag colors are harder to read than others. And using a spotting scope is a learned skill that takes practice. Um, you can't expect someone to pick up a spotting scope for the first time and, and be an expert right away. And also your, your brain can play tricks on you. Um, even the most experienced observers after sitting out on the beach for hours looking at flocks of birds running around, it's really easy to start to transpose characters or, or make mistakes. So misreading flags, um, can lead to issues around tag loss. So if a flag becomes effectively unreadable after some period of time, that could be a problem um, and violate some assumptions of capture recapture models. Uh, but the problem I want to talk about are the issue of false positive detections of individuals. So seeing birds that aren't really there. Now, again, the issue of individual misidentification um, isn't really a new idea or problem in capture recapture modeling. But when I was digging into this, everything that I could find in the literature was dealing with this certain type of misidentification. And that's when the potential misID occurs on the first encounter of a new individual, but then subsequent encounters uh, serve to confirm that ID. So think non-invasive genetic sampling or photographic capture recapture that is used as natural marks. However, with the mark recite data, individual ID is really only certain on the first encounter because that's when you have the bird in the hand and the flag is applied. The potential for misID occurs after that when you're out in the field reciting the flags. And so in the literature, this first type of misID is often referred to as ghosts. Um, they create ghost capture histories. And so I'm gonna refer to this second type as zombies. And I've just really lucked out because I, it seems like every time I talk about this, it's right around Halloween. So um, I just feel like it really works. But let me tell you a bit more about why these are different. So, Here's an example of how ghosts could occur in your data. So say you're going out to survey a whale population by taking pictures of tails and then using the individual markings to identify individuals. Well, maybe on occasion uh, two, individual B is seen and photographed, but it's misclassified as being a new individual, individual C. Maybe the lighting was poor or with a different angle. For some reason, it was misclassified. As a result, you get a new fake individual entering your capture history, and that individual is only seen once. Um, that's a pretty common assumption of the models that, that can deal with these types of errors. Um, and so these are, that's why they're called ghosts. They kind of appear in your data and then are gone again. 
And they actually present a very similar problem as transients, but mathematically it's more complicated because the two capture histories B and C are not independent from each other. So zombies on the other hand, so now the first time we see an individual, it's in the hand, and then after that it's field resightings. Well, what if on occasion four we misread this flag of individual B and record it as a new code that doesn't exist, that's never been applied, it's not real. Well, actually that type of error is pretty easy to filter out of the data because we know all of the marks that have really been put out in the population. What's more insidious is if individual B is misidentified as individual A, uh, who wasn't really there on that occasion, but we saw them. And this becomes really problematic as the length of the study increases and begins to exceed the average lifespan of the study organism. Because as a result, you get this capture history where you have um, no fake individuals, but you have false positive detections. And if the study starts to get really long and it becomes more likely that individual A is actually dead, then you could have them being resurrected into your data, which is why I call them zombies. And these two different types of errors cause different types of bias. So th these are the results of a simple simulation study that I did to demonstrate this. So ghosts cause um, negative bias that's constant over time. And this is also pretty well established in the literature. Zombies, however, cause a positive bias in survival estimates. And that bias is more extreme for earlier time periods. So you end up seeing this spurious negative trend in survival over time. So after realizing this, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this potential problem. And so I developed a more extensive simulation study where I simulated data sets under a range of scenarios that varied in the true annual survival probability, the detection probability, the study length, and the error rate, and fit a time-dependent Cormac-Jolly-Sieber model and found the root mean squared error or RMSC of the survival estimates relative to the known true value. And so that's what I've plotted here on the y-axis. On the x is the study length, so the number of years of mark recapture data. The columns here are the different detection probabilities, and then the rows are the different survival rates. And what we found is that the bias from these errors is worst, worst when survival probability is low and detection probability is high. Uh, the bias also increases with study length and increases with the error rate, of course. So in digging into this problem, however, I realized that in many capture recapture studies, you might see individuals multiple times in a year, um, but that just gets reduced to a one or a zero in your capture history. But what if we use that information? So for red knot, we usually see birds on average about four or five times in a year, some as many as 50 times. So we thought, you know, it's possible but unlikely that the same exact misread would happen more than once. So what if we just removed all instances where a bird was only seen a single time in a given year? If sampling intensity is low, um, some real observations will be lost, but this is likely to be pretty effective at removing most, if not all, of the errors. Well, we can use that simulated data to look at that as well. So I took those simulated data sets and refit the CJS model after applying this data filtering and compared the resulting um, error, the root mean squared error of the survival estimates. So here now the different color points are either for when the single observations were removed in green, so that's the filtering, or the purple where we didn't do anything to the data. So we found that in some cases when detection probability is low, um, this data filtering is counterproductive. It induces more bias because you end up throwing away a lot of real data points. Um, but the bias from misreads was relatively low in many, many of these scenarios anyway, so it's not that big of a problem. In the scenarios where the bias was the worst, so up here in this top right corner, that's where we see a big um, benefit of applying this data filtering. It's really effective at eliminating the bias from misreads without um, 
yeah, without throwing away too much data because your detection probability is so high. So the next question was, of course, is this something that we need to be concerned about for red knot? Well, one of the people who began the study in the late 90s had the forethought to withhold some flags from circulation in 2008. So he thought that these misreads might be a problem and thought the best way to sort of empirically um, estimate whether they were occurring was just to take some of the flags that were supposed to be put on birds and put them away in a drawer instead. So we took all of the red knot flag recitings. So these were flags that were meant for red knots. We looked at all the red knot flag recitings of the same color over this time period and calculated the proportion of those recitings that were of these withheld flags that we, we know those are incorrect. And that was 0.32% overall. So we think of this as sort of our minimum error rate that we could have in this system. But we also looked at flags that were reported only a single time in a year. So as I said, most flags are seen more than once. Here I'm showing the histogram of the number of recitings in one year. On average, about it's about five, but it's upwards of you know 50 or 60 times potentially. And that's because the sampling protocol has observers record individuals in 30 minute increments. And observers are often going out in pairs and might be looking at the same flock. So it's oftentimes we have more than one observation of an individual. And so we considered flags that were only seen a single time in a year to be maybe suspicious and um, found that they accounted for 6.6% of the total recitings. And so we think of this as our maximum error rate. It's likely to be an overestimate because some of those single observation flags um, very well might have been real, but this at least gives us a way to sort of bound our understanding of the problem in this system. And I think it's important to point out that everyone makes mistakes. So we also calculated observer-specific misread rates. So there's a histogram of those observer-specific rates on the left, um, both for the confirmed and then the possible. And even the most experienced observers had non-zero misread rate, which was important to uh, realize because I think at first there was a little bit of um, negativity towards maybe some of the less experienced observers, like they were causing all the problems, but it, it, everyone was contributing in some way. Um, we also looked at whether the total number of observations that an observer had entered into the database, so this is a proxy for their experience, um, we looked at whether that was a good predictor of their misread rate and found that as the total number of observations increased, the observer-specific misread rates decreased on average, and also the among observer variation decreased. So they, they started to converge onto the same uh, average error rate. So going back to what that means for inference, so going back to this figure from a couple slides ago, for the red knot system, the closest scenario is here. Um, so we actually don't expect bias to be that bad. And these are the results for when error rate is 0.1, um, and the error rate in our system was lower than that. So um, that's great. You know, at first I was convinced that we were going to need to figure out how to model these misidentifications explicitly but we quickly realized just how complicated that was going to be. Because when you start to dive into this problem, you realize there's a lot of non-independence and non-randomness to how the errors occur. So it makes the models get really complicated really quickly. Um, this was actually an important lesson for me to take a step back and realize that that model would have been really interesting to develop probably, but it just really wasn't necessary here. And luckily a few years later, some people much cleverer than me have figured out how to do it. Um, this is a paper coming out by Eldar Rakhimberdiev and colleagues in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. Um, I think it should be coming out soon if it's not out already. That describes that model, so keep an eye out for that. All right, so the first tool we used here was simulations to really get a handle on the problem and figure out whether it was something we needed to worry about. And it turns out that a more enhanced sort of QA, QC data filtering process was all that we needed to effectively remove potential errors without losing too much precision. But remember that that trade-off really depends on the specific of the study system. Okay, so moving on to this issue of variable sampling effort. 
Well, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit of shorebird ecology first to give some context here. So the keys to stopover success for shorebirds are rapid mass gain and on-time departure. So this study from the late 90s, I think, demonstrates this really nicely, where they show the body mass of shorebirds um, nearly doubling over about a week and a half. And that body mass increase is mostly due to an increase in fat mass. Those fat stores are the fuel that they need to complete their journey to their breeding sites. And here I've showed you is a very skinny red knot um, that probably newly arrived in Delaware Bay. And actually this red flag means that it was initially um, marked in Argentina. So we know that it, it came a long way compared to a much fatter. And this is not even the fattest uh, red knot I've seen. It's just the best picture I could find. But they do, they fatten up quite a bit in a very, very short time period. So one thing we were really interested in looking at was trying to better understand the dynamics of mass gain and how that might be different for different species and how that's influenced by food availability. So again, birds are captured via cannon nets while they're in these foraging flocks. Um, I love this picture of the crew running down to the net that's just been deployed to get all the birds out. And as part of the processing, uh, weights are taken. But the number and the timing of cannon net captures uh, varies a lot among years due to things like researcher availability, the weather conditions, the bird behavior, both the shorebirds and also peregrine falcons, which are a predator that will sometimes want to hang out in the area and, and cause the birds to be very unsettled, as well as uh, you know, luck. And so to illustrate this, I've plotted um, the masses of red knot uh, that have been captured as a function of the day in the season when they were caught and then the facets are for different years and you see all these masses kind of stacking up in lines Th that would be all the birds captured on a single day um, and so for some years we have really great coverage across the whole season in some years there's only one or a couple of catches and then in other years there's you know a lot of catches but they're condensed all in the center of the um, stopover period that doesn't, we don't, so we don't get a lot of information about the, the whole um, time period. So how can we take this and make comparisons among years, given all this variation? Well, so this is a plot of the average and standard deviation of masses of birds caught on each day of the season, and this is all years pooled together. The purple points are red knot and the green are ready turn stone, which are a bit smaller. Um, and if you sort of squint at this figure, you might see that these masses increase in a nonlinear way across the season. And the shape of this curve tells us a few interesting things about the dynamics of mass gain. The low plateau tells us about the arrival mass or the minimum population mass. The upper plateau tells us about the departure mass. The inflection point tells us about the timing of mass gain. And the slope of the middle part tells us about the rate. And these are the four parameters of the four parameter logistic curve model that I use to estimate the average mass of birds captured on a given day of a given year. Um, and I fit this model separately for each species. Now, it might seem obvious to some of the fisheries folks on the call to model mass gain in this way, but it was sort of a revelation to me at the time and it was inspired by um, some work I'd seen in fisheries of folks using growth modeling of fishery stocks, like the von Berlanthe growth model, for instance. And so in this model, the mass of individual I is drawn from a normal distribution centered around that average predicted mass with a catch specific variance. And the parameters of the logistic curve, that min, max, R, and P, um, we're estimated with annual random effects. So we give a prior to the overall average and the among year variance, and then estimate year specific values centered around that average with normal error. And so this structure then also allows us to really easily include covariates and directly estimate the relationship between, for example, horseshoe crab egg availability and the maximum rate of masking. So I am a very visual learner, 
So I like to use conceptual diagrams to understand models like this. Um, so here the data in the green boxes are the individual capture masses and covariates related to stopover conditions. We estimate the average mass across the season, which is informed by those hyperparameters about the overall averages and among year variances. And this allows us to then pool information across years, filling in the gaps for years with sparse data, while also explicitly modeling the variation among years. And a really cool feature of the four parameter logistic curve that was handy here is that we can use the derivatives of that function to approximate the days on which the population experienced the greatest change in the rate of mass gain, um, which we interpret as the beginning and end of the peak refueling period, which is another really interesting thing to look at uh, in this case. So here are the model predictions for mass gain curves for red knot. On the y-axis is mass, on the x is the day of the season, the dashed line is the global average, and then the solid lines and shaded region are the year-specific predictions with the 95% credible interval. And then the points and vertical lines are the average and standard deviation of masses. Those are the data. Um, so in years when data are sparse, like uh, 2010, the estimates shrink right down to the global mean. But this model is also really flexible at capturing annual variation and deviations when it occurs. Here are the predicted masses for ruddy turnstone. Uh, immediately, you can see maybe that the ruddy turnstone have much flatter curves overall. So they have a more kind of slow and steady weight gain um, process instead of the fast paced red knot strategy. And there's just a lot less variation from year to year as well, um, which aligns with some of our predictions that as generalists, they would be less sensitive to annual fluctuations. And by looking at the estimated relationships between horseshoe crab egg availability and the inflection point of the curve and the maximum rate of mass gain, we found that in years with low egg availability, red knot gained weight later in the season and more quickly, which we think enables them to avoid even more delayed departure from stopover. So in in years when they're delayed by low horseshoe crab egg availability, they speed up at the end of the season to try to make up some lost time. That's our, that's our hypothesis anyway. Um, ruddy turnstone were not affected by horseshoe crab egg availability. Okay, so to understand overall dynamics and year specific deviations, we used what else? Hierarchical modeling uh, to borrow strength across years. And this approach was also inspired by practices in other systems and fisheries field. So um, another sort of tool here is looking to other systems for how they handle similar questions. All right, so last uh, challenge here is dealing with flow through dynamics. So I mentioned uh, previously that horseshoe, the horseshoe crab harvest management plan includes um, as part of its objective, um, a clause about supporting sustainable red knot populations. So that, that means is that within the optimization that's used to determine the harvest policy, they need a model of horseshoe crab population dynamics, a model of red knot population dynamics, and importantly, a link between the two. So the initial versions of these models were developed around 2008 and at that time, the monitoring program was only a few years old, so they had to rely very heavily on demographic estimates from the literature to parameterize these models. I'm now involved in a revision process in which all of these models are being updated to use more empirical estimates from this system. But for red knot, we still don't have great estimates of fecundity or juvenile survival. So they nest in really remote areas in the Arctic tundra at low densities. Their nests can be really hard to find because they're just these little scrapes in the ground. Um, first year birds stay on their wintering grounds and don't breed and can be quite spread out during that time. Uh, but we have a lot of data collected during stopover, which informs adult survival estimates. And I wanted to figure out how we could use that information 
to broaden our inference beyond the stopover setting. So to do that, I developed an integrated population model. So thinking back to intro to population ecology, the change in population size is simply a function of the births and immigrants to the population, as well as deaths and e-migrants. So additions and subtractions. Well, we have those aerial counts conducted each year. And if we can assume that they are proportional to the population size, uh, which giant asterisk there, because I'm gonna come back to that assumption. But if we can assume that, then we can use them to get an estimate of lambda, the change in population size from one year to the next. And the mark site data can be used to estimate apparent annual survival probability using standard mark recapture modeling. And so by combining these two sources of information, we can then also estimate this missing quantity which is the number of new adults entering the breeding population each year. Now, let's come back to that assumption that counts are proportional to the population size, because there are a couple of issues that we need to address when we're talking about counts conducted during stopover. So within a given year, birds are arriving and departing throughout the season, and the number of birds present on any given day might follow a curve like this. And we have a count conducted on some day, but the question is what proportion of the stopover population is actually present when the count was done? The second question has to do with the potential for birds to skip Delaware Bay altogether. We know this happens from some geolocator data. So we also need to account for what proportion of the flyway population is even using Delaware Bay in that year. So we have these flow through dynamics, which means we can't assume population closure at any point, which really limits the appropriate modeling methods that, um, that can be used. And so the challenge here was figuring out essentially how to make the counts useful um, given this complete lack of closure. So how can we interpret changes in those aerial counts, um, teasing apart the demographics from the more behavioral site use aspects? Well, the answer lies in the reciting data. So the stopover period is divided into these nine three-day sampling periods. As I said, birds can arrive at any time, they stay for some length of time, and then they leave again. And observers go out and survey beaches um, in every period looking for flag birds. And so we have a series of within season encounters for each year. Well, with that data, we can then estimate the probabilities that a bird arrives in any given sampling period or just before any given sampling period, um, this parameter delta, as well as the probability of staying from one period to the next which is this persistence probability, psi. And then this parameter tau is a transience parameter. So this is what we call stopover residency probability in this case. Um, this is the probability that a bird remains in the study area for at least two sampling periods in a year. And we included it because we were interested in capturing the birds that were staying in Delaware Bay for an extended time and using it as their primary refueling site as opposed to birds that might just stop for a day before moving on to another site to really rest and refuel. Okay, so with those estimates, we can derive a probability of being present during any given sampling period. Um, how does that work? Well, the proportion of birds present in the first period are just those that have just arrived. The proportion present in the second period are those that arrived previously and stayed, as well as new arrivals and so on. We can just build that up for each sampling period um, to determine the proportion present. And these boxes represent those Jolly Seaver model parameters. And then we use them to calculate the overall probability of presence for each period, what I'm calling omega. So this is the probability of being present during a given sampling period, conditional on the fact that the birds stopped in Delaware Bay at all in that year. Okay, so that answers the first question. But if we then take that Jolly Seaver model, we can think about those processes that's happening within each year. 
and we analyze them in the open robust design model. So in this model, the robust design part refers to the fact that we have repeated opportunities to see individuals in each year. And it's open because birds can arrive or depart at any point during the season in each year. Individuals can then survive from one year to the next with probability phi. And this model also allows us to account for birds that skip Delaware Bay because this is a form of temporary e-migration from the SETI system. So the repeated sampling within years allows us to estimate these two temporary e-migration probabilities the probability of returning to the site if present in the previous year, and the probability of returning to the site if not present in the previous year. So with those temporary e-migration parameters, we can then calculate the proportion present in any occasion of any year uh, using this equation, which I call pi. And so here are the estimates of pi um, in panel A, are the estimates of pi across the season. Each year is a different color, and then we have red knot on the left and ruddy turns on the right. I know I sort of said I was gonna just talk about red knot here, but I think it's important, it's interesting to compare these estimates um, among species too. So overall, they follow a pattern that we might expect, uh, but this is way more consistent for ruddy turnstone than for red knot. And you can really see that by taking a slice of the top figure. So if you, if you take a slice where those dashed lines are at uh, sampling period seven and turn that slice 90 degrees, that's what panel B is. So this is the probability of presence um, for any given year in that same sampling period. And you can really then see how much this varies from year to year for red knot, whereas ready turnstone are much more consistent. So bringing that back to how we use that to adjust the counts, if the total flyway population is some number n, the number that's available to be counted is a subset of that, which we can now calculate. And because, um, and we then assume that the aerial counts are normally distributed around that number available with some counting error. So in an integrated population model, the link between submodels is the life cycle model. Shorebirds have a two-stage life cycle in which juveniles don't breed or migrate north. So breeding doesn't start until age two, but because we're monitoring them during pre-breeding spring migration, um, that means only adults are observable. So I split that adult group into two groups, uh, returning adults and new recruits, and estimate a recruitment rate rho which is effectively a product of fecundity and juvenile survival. And this rate operates on a two year time lag. Um, we assume that the number of new recruits comes from a Poisson distribution based on the population size and recruitment rate from two years previous. And the number of returning adults is binomially distributed based on the population size and survival probability from the previous year. So information about N comes from the counts, information about survival comes from the mark site data, and then rho is this latent parameter. And so here are the estimates of survival, recruitment, and then population growth rate, lambda, for each species. And estimated recruitment rate was fairly low, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty, of course, but these are the sum of the first estimates of recruitment for these species in this flyway. So that alone gives us a lot more information than we had before. And even though recruitment was fairly low, estimates of lambda indicate that these populations were both most likely stable over this time period. And this is 2005 to 2014. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you the newest results of the model uh, linking red knot recruitment and survival to horseshoe crab abundance, it's part of a Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission um, report, still in draft stages. So I'm not allowed to talk about it, but using this modeling framework, we were able to estimate the parameters needed for the red knot population model. Um, so all empirical estimates based on this system. And most importantly, we were able to estimate the relationships between horseshoe crab abundance and red knot survival and recruitment, which also goes into that optimization. 
So to deal with the flow through dynamics and make the most of all the available data, we developed some new applications of older models. Um, open robust design models have been around for 20 plus years. We just built upon that existing framework. So I hope that some of what I shared today resonated with you. Um, I'm sure that you've all used similar tools and other methods to tackle your own challenges in the data sets that you work with. I thought I'd just take a few minutes at the end here for some reflections, I guess, um, and talk a little bit about some of the lessons or takeaways from what I've shared. So first, we all know this, but sometimes the reminder is helpful. Understanding the nuances of data collection is so important. Um, as quantitative ecologists, we just want people to give us the data sometimes, right? But getting out into the field or spending a lot of time talking to the people who collected the data can lead to critical insights or alert you to possible issues to address in your analysis. I don't think I ever would have thought that flag misreads were a problem until I spent a few hours trying to do it myself and realized just how hard it is. Uh, second, a more complicated model is not always the answer, except for when it is. So after simulated, simulating the misidentification problem and estimating the error rates in our data, we realized we really didn't need um, a fancy model to account for this problem explicitly. We could deal with it really effectively using enhanced QAQC. However, to estimate masking dynamics, a relatively complicated hierarchical model was extremely useful at answering our ecological questions. Third, and um, I guess I'll say it again, quantitative ecology is a creative field. Um, sure, we're rigorous with the math and statistics, and that's very important, but we are also problem solvers tasked with extracting inference from data. And I think that's a really fun and satisfying part of the work that I do. So I just wanna end by acknowledging the many organizations that supported this work um, in different ways, um, as well as uh, the quantitative seminar series, Abby, Brielle, and Amelia in particular for inviting me to give this seminar. Um, I think we have some time for questions, so I'm excited uh, to hear your thoughts on some of these issues, but you can also reach me via email or on Twitter as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, that was a great talk. Um, yeah, so there's the Q&A uh, box to answer your questions, and as they come in, I'll forward them along to you. Um, I knew I was going to like this talk, as I said before, since it was about birds, but I'm actually working on the robust design, open robust design, and then um, IPM2, so it was even more applicable than I could have imagined going into it. So thank you. That was really helpful and um, really interesting to hear about your work. I tracked down your paper, your recent paper, during the talk as well. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I hope it's, I hope it's helpful to you. Let's see, I don't have anything coming in quite yet. One thing not quantitative too, I noticed was, um, but I just hadn't seen before, was the little PVC piping that you use to restrain um, the shorebirds, it looks like during weighing. Is that, I had never seen before, it looks like it's quite, quite handy. Yeah, that's really useful. There's a couple of different, um, that's one method that they use. And there's, they also have these, I don't, actually don't know what they're made of. They're a little like plastic, um, kind of flexible plastic with Velcro. So you can, mm -hmm. and that's actually more useful because you can um, create different size openings so that over the course of the season, as the birds are getting fatter, you can adjust right. your, um, your weighing mechanism to accommodate them because right. it really is remarkable how um, the difference in body size over the course of the season, um, it's really yeah, I would. Oh, I was just going to say, I was wondering about that. Yeah, if you need different size of PVC at some point. Um, so I did just forward a question along to you. I'll just read it really quick. Um, does the field method employ photography to help with the tag ID? Yeah, so this is a rabbit hole that I um, almost went down. <laughs> um, using photographs to confirm IDs. Um, this is, and I think that that could be really useful. Um, 
in this case, as I said, we ended up not even really needing to model the problem. But I think that if you if you were going to model it, using those those photographed birds as sort of a confirmed present uh, detection versus birds that were recited but not photographed as maybe being like a um, potential mis ID, I think could be a way to to try to model it. So using that extra, you know, using another source of information from photographs to essentially verify some observations um, could be useful. Yeah. In this case, we did not do it. Yeah, and it looks like that was from Hendrix. I can um, unmute you if you have any follow up comments to that, but I don't like to put people on the spot like that. But hopefully that sufficiently answers your question. Let me know if not. Oh, he said, yep, uh, that answered it. Thank you. Oh, here we go. We've got one more. Question is, when determining the effects of misreading tags, how slash where did you get your estimates for P and theta? Sorry, I'm just pulling up that question now. Where did you, how and where did you get your estimates for P and Data. Can you clarify oh. what you mean? Yeah, data? I think my it's getting um these boxes are so small. Yeah. Can you see who asked that question on your end? Sorry, I'm having trouble making it out. Um, yeah, it's yeah, really well, okay. tiny, but. Yeah, no, I did find it. Okay, I'm going to um, unmute you, Sarah, for you to clarify. Yeah, that's right. sorry. Okay, yeah. here you go. Uh, sorry for the confusion. It was earlier in the talk when you had a three by three grid of varying values. I think P was maybe like capture probability and theta was another one. And you were talking about how they determine the effects of the error from misreading tags and how you picked out one that applied to this particular situation. I was wondering how you determined that that particular situation was applicable to this population. Got it. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Um, so those were estimates of, um, of P, detection probability, and then B, the survival probability. Um, and so I, I chose simulation inputs just to kind of cover a broad range. But then when looking at the question is, you know, how did I, I sort of said, okay, well, here's sort of where we are for red knot. How did I know that? Just from previous work in the system um, and from my own estimates, like sort of preliminary analysis of what detection and survival were for these birds. So in our case, detection probability is quite high because we have so much observer effort. So it's about 0.6 um, and then it varies from year to year, but that's the average. And then survival probability is also quite high. These are quite long lived birds. Um, so survival probability is about 0.9 um, or like in the up like 0. 0.85 to 0.9. Um, so just based on just based on knowledge um, that no, that knowledge from previous studies and from my own preliminary work. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, is there a way to make this bigger? Hold on. I wish I could tell you. I can read it to you, though. I do want to to make it larger. Uh, this is from Abby Bratt. She says, "Really nice talk, Anna." I'm curious about other types of misidentification or partial identification errors in the data set. Did you find a significant number of ghost encounters in addition to zombies? Any partial identifications as well? So um, partial identifications, that's an interesting question. And that's something, so we don't, observers don't record partial identifications. Um, so I don't, that, we, we don't know. But I mean, anecdotally, it. We know that it happens. You know, you'll talk to them like, "Oh, I, I got, could only get the first two characters of that flag. You know, couldn't get the last one." But the the sort of protocol and the observer training is they're only supposed to record observations if they can get a full reading of the flag and like are are confident in that in that flag read. But I think the partial identifications. I mean, if we had that information, that could be really interesting as well to look at. Um, but unfortunately, we just don't. Uh, so then the other part of the question was, 
did I find ghosts in addition to zombies? Yeah, so in the sort of data filtering, um, you know, I can't remember offhand the numbers, but there definitely were a good number of um, impossible observations, let's call them. So flag recited, you know, observations of flags in the field that were either flags that had never been deployed at all or flags that were seen before they were deployed onto a bird. Um, so we were, you know, I obviously filtered those out as well, but um, I should look at the, um, you know, sort of the frequency of how often those occurred. Um, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, Abby is a great person to talk to about um, partial identification. Um, so we have another talk or another question. Anna, thank you for your talk today. I had been in a meeting about red knots, first two crabs and conflicts with aquaculture just yesterday. I wanted to listen to gain more insight into a medium length data set of phytoplankton that I manage and what types of approaches might be available for. Oh, I lost it here. <laughs> what types of approaches might be available for analysis and potential pitfalls? Thank you for helping me see um, new avenues of exploration. If that data set, yep. So sorry, not a quite question there, but a comment. No, that's uh, yeah. I'm really glad that um, there was something in in there that was helpful or you know gave a spark of inspiration to you. I certainly have taken lots of inspiration from other systems as well. And one more here too. Um, a great talk and agree with the comment on creativity with modeling. Um, did you see any relationship between recruitment rates and horseshoe crab presence? Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't think I'm really allowed to go into detail about some of the, the specifics with red knot, but overall, for I looked at this for ready turnstone as well and Sanderling. Um, I didn't really talk about Sanderling today, but they were also in the data set. Um, and overall, no. And I, but I don't think um, I think that part of that is because of the sort of the fact that the recruitment rate really encompasses like a two year, like two years of, of demographics, right? Like breeding success, fecundity, chick survival, juvenile survival. There's a lot of sort of information in that one number. And so I don't think it's it probably should be too surprising that it, we can't find a signal between that that estimate and just you know a measure a covariate from one relatively short time period. Um, I suppose unless that relationship was very very strong. Um, otherwise, there's just so much noise in the data that uh, ultimately it was hard to find really any signal between recruitment and and any covariate. But still useful, I think, to have those estimates at all. So that's not to be down on the on the effort or on the uh, results, but um, just yeah, got to be realistic <laughs> what you can expect. And then um, we do have one more here too with these last couple of minutes. Um, so let's see. So GPS tags were used in some birds. Um, any information in the double tagging of GPS and site tags? The, um, can you the can you repeat tags. the question? Oh, sure. Yep. So it says, um, so GPS tags were used on some birds, question mark. Um, any information in the double tagging of GPS and the recite tags? So, yeah, so not as a part of the um, GPS tags have been deployed on some um, red knot and ready turnstone and geolocators and also nano tags. Um, so diff all different kinds of um, transmitters have been deployed. Those data are, um, that's all part of a different kind of independent project. So unfortunately those data, um, at least at this time, aren't, weren't available to me to use, but could potentially give insights into, um, yeah, sort of comparing, like uh, just using this, those two different observation methods to look at survival and both the reciting and then the, the GPS or geolocator data. Um, but yeah, not something that was available to me, unfortunately. All right, great. Well, I think that's just about the time that we have for today. I just forwarded a comment along to you. Finally, I 
figured out how to, to read the questions without um, unless I'm needing to read them live uh, and schooling the little box. So um, that's my own technical difficulties. But thank you so much for your time. And um, it was a really fascinating talk and I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone yeah, who came today as well. This um, was recorded and will be posted um, so what people can watch at a later date. And um, we will be sending out information about our talk um, next week on Monday. Yeah, great. Thank you all for attending and thanks again for the invitation. Yeah, take care. Bye, everyone.